Born into an influential Dutch family, Van Hall initially studied to become an officer in the Merchant Marine. But after having worked for some years as third mate he was rejected because of his eyesight. Unable to work in the Merchant Marine, he moved to New York City in 1929. His brother, the future mayor of Amsterdam Gias Van Hall, who already worked at a bank, helped him get a job with a Wall Street firm. Having thus been introduced to banking, Van Hall returned to the Netherlands and became a banker and stockbroker. After the Germans invaded the Netherlands in May 1940, a fund was established to help families of merchant sailors. Van Hall was asked to help set up the Amsterdam chapter together with his brother Gilles. Because of his banking experience, Van Hall was able to provide funding with the help of guarantees by the Dutch government in London. Soon thereafter, the Germans began taking anti-Jewish and forced labor measures, and resistance against these measures increased. Van Hall expanded his fundraising activities for all kinds of resistance groups, and he became known as the banker to the resistance. One of the ways in which Van Hall raised funds for the resistance was the robbing of the Dutch National Bank. With the approval of the Dutch government in exile, the Van Halls managed to obtain as much as 50 million Dutch guilders. Together with his brother, Van Hall falsified bank bonds and exchanged them in the bank for the real bonds. With these, paper money was collected. In 1944, Paul Raven was the leader of the NSF, National Support Fund. Nicknames. Besides being called the banker to the resistance, Paul Raven had various additional nicknames in the resistance movement to ensure that his real name was not exposed. For example, he was called the oil man for his abilities to lubricate the friction between resistance groups, and primarily Van Tuyl. On the 27th of January 1945, the meeting place was given away by a member of the resistance who had been arrested the day before and who wrongly believed the members of the meeting would know he had been arrested and would not attend the meeting. Although the Germans had a vague idea there had to be somebody who coordinated the finances for the resistance, they never found out it was Van Hall. In January 1945, but Van Hall was executed in Harlem as revenge for the death of a high-ranking police officer. We staan op dit moment in het midden van een van de grootste omwentelingen die de Europese geschiedenis ooit heeft gekend. Het is een feit. Meneer Van Hal. Misschien als je Durbeck kende zou je liever Durbeck hebben dan mij. Nee. Ik kende me nog geen tien minuten of mijn haar was al zwart als dat van Dorbeck. Je zult zien dat ik net zoveel van je hou als het weer blond is. Kust groeit de haat van de Franse bevolking tegen de geallieerden van dag tot dag. Dat hebben de Anglo-Amerikanen te danken aan hun lukraak, bombarderen en zinloos verwoesten van Franse steden en dorpen. Zo gaan in Frankrijk de bevrijders te werk. Tanks worden met alle wapens bestreden. De strijd om Europa gaat verder. Kijk, zie je nog wel? Wacht 
Wacht, meneer. Wat is er? Pas op, dat is Tucker. Houd hem. Waarom houdt u mij tegen? De portier heeft me lastig gevallen zonder enige reden. Veel persoonsbewijs. Ja, maar we zijn de dame. Die dame is nog drinnen. Goed, hier weer. Oh, u bent bij de politie. Ik heb dienst. Komen Sie mal mit. The Reichsbank competition began before the Nazis took power and clarified their architectural propaganda, which explains why several modernists, such as Walter Gropius, Heinrich Tessino, Hans Poeltzig and Bruno Tort submitted their own proposals. Sumis would discover his brand of modernism was not appropriate for Nazi civic architecture. Modernist tropes included functionalism, economy and mutability. National Socialist architecture required permanence and symbolic subjugation. In short, they required buildings that dwarfed the individual in order to maximize control. Modernist rhetoric, which stressed individual empowerment and progressive epimorality, could not meet these wishes. Didmi's mixture of modernist and monumentalist expression propose alternate paths for the rhetorically liberating effects of modernism to enfold into the totalitarian project of the new regime? Was it, conversely, a subtle critique or expression of frustration at the incongruity of a modernist and fascist union? An apt, but more direct, 
parallel is evident in Hans Schirrand's bench house of 1935, built in Berlin during the Nazi regime. For political reasons Schirrand was obligated to express a traditional vernacular on the front facade, but on the backside, where, supposedly, the government wasn't looking, Schirrand broke open the form and facade with sheets of glass, maintaining a modernist open relationship with nature. As in the Ray Eats Bank, the closed front was well behaved and the open backside was liberated, serving both the spiritual and pragmatic needs of the occupants. Untethered by state control. Nine, this could figure one, MVDR the Ray Eats Bank Competition, 1933. Left, front facade. Right, isometric plan of main banking floor. Images by author. The Ethical Imperative 253 be considered a masking rather than an exposed synthesis of opposing narratives. In summation, it is difficult to read the Ray Eats Bank as clearly monumental classical or as purely lightweight modernist. It is a Janus. The motivations that led Mies to this final direction remain conflicted. Although Mies understood that he would not secure work without the support of those in power with the capital to invest in architecture. Tension arises when a modernist compulsorily advances new agendas that are antithetical to the modernist project. This irresolution leads to an ambiguity of intention. Either the building was a compromise towards monumentality, to stay employed as an architect in Germany under a new regime, or it was a new way forward that suggested a synthesis between the monumental and the modern. Both of these options would be considered unsuccessful, not only because Mies failed to convince the Nazis of an alternative to neoclassical bombast, but because he did not resolve the antipodal architectural philosophies. Perhaps the duality between modern and monumental remained intentionally unresolved as a stubborn yet subtle critique of the capricious Reich. Dietlef Mertens perceives this trepidation within the menacing shadows of the final project charcoal renderings, Perhaps Mies did seek to express the character of the new national socialist state, not the character conveyed by its propaganda, but rather its true character, soulless, empty and inhuman. Mies van der Rohe's desire to become Hitler's spear, or Mies's effort to persuade the Nazis, in the mid-thirty seconds, with Goebbels help to accept modernism as the design brand of the Third Reich. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe depicts the architect late in his life, confronted with his time as the final Bauhaus director, and his refusal to take a political stance amid pressure from the newly established Nazi government and communist students. The interviewer confronts Mies about his unwillingness to take a political position amid pressure both from communist students and the newly established Nazi government. Focusing on the events that led to the closure of the Bauhaus by the Gestapo in 1933, including Mises' meeting with Alfred Rosenberg, his meeting with a young Gestapo officer in an attempt to keep the Bauhaus open under the Nazi regime, and his interest in continuing his practice in Germany. The film questions cultural notions of modern architecture as an aesthetic reflection of progressive humanistic values. By examining the nature of the relationship between Mies and the Nazis, insight is gained not only into the climate of the last days of the Bauhaus and its clash with fascist forces, but also into historic and contemporary principles of morality. The architect late in his life, confronted with his time as the final Bauhaus director, and his refusal to take a political stance amid pressure from the newly established Nazi government and communist students. The interviewer confronts Mies about his unwillingness to take a political position amid pressure both from communist students and the newly established Nazi government. Focusing on the events that led to the closure of the Bauhaus by the Gestapo in 1933, including Mises' meeting with Alfred Rosenberg, his meeting with a young Gestapo officer in an attempt to keep the Bauhaus open under the Nazi regime, and his interest in continuing his practice in Germany.
The film questions cultural notions of modern architecture as an aesthetic reflection of progressive humanistic values. By examining the nature of the relationship between Mies and the Nazis, insight is gained not only into the climate of the last days of the Bauhaus and its clash with fascist forces, but also into historic and contemporary principles of morality.